Welcome everyone to our fabulous session on combating ageism. We're really excited to dig into this conversation today to talk about one of the issues that we roll our eyes and are frustrated with, but really don't necessarily get to the heart of what to do about it from a practical point of view. And we have here an expert panel bringing all kinds of different perspectives to it. By way of introduction, I'm Laura Tambon Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization, and I'm involved with AgeWell in a number of ways, as well as perhaps being their biggest fan. With me today, in no particular order, is Dr. Jane Barrett, Secretary General of the International Federation on Aging, Anne Marie Wright, co founder of UR Unlimited. Olive as well, and we have Gregor as well from Help Age Canada. So we're so delighted to have all of you here today to talk about the issue of ageism. For those of you joining, we'd love you to jump into the chat. So do feel free to do so. We'd love to hear where you are, where you're joining us from, what you do, and perhaps maybe share a little bit about ageism that you've either experienced or seen or issues about ageism that you're thinking about. So I will encourage you all the way through. And instead of a really formal Q&A at the after, I'm going to ask you to throw your questions and comments all the way in. And I will make sure to get your thoughts into our conversation in real time. So as you're asking them, I will weave them in. So jump in right there throw your questions, we're in there. And we have lots of other friends in the chat as well. So if we're talking about certain issues or links, we can make sure that people have an opportunity to gather them. I want to give a couple of little plugs before I begin. You have the full bios of all of our fantastic experts today, but you know, there's a little bit of did you know that I'm going to share for each one of them. Gregor Snedden is very dark behind him, but that's because he is in Addis Abba, where he's overseeing a monitoring mission that's looking at 50,000 refugees and the welfare, particularly around older people in that country. Did you know that also, Olive has published a fabulous book. She is a published poet. And we're going to share some of her great work there. And it is called Pandemic Poems. And I can tell you, we all need a little bit more of the creative arts in our life right now. Did you know that we also have fantastic extra works that Anne Marie is absolutely involved in? And her work has a number of particular focus points on ageism. And we'll make sure that we put that link as well for her idea space that you can go to. And that Jane Barrett has been leading the conversation on ageism, both in Canada and around the world. She is one of the busiest people I know and is always bringing us challenges to do more, not just at a governmental level, but at a personal level. And it was one of my personal inspirations. So given that, we have a lot to talk about at this point. And I'm going to kick it off with the first kind of easiest and hardest question at the same time. The easy part is please introduce yourself a little bit in the way of what you do. And then tell us about how you wrestle with or define ageism in your work. And Gregor, you're to the immediate right of me, and I'm going to kick off with you. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Laura. I am here in uh, Addis Ababa. Help Age Canada has been around since 1975, and we work at, in Canada and internationally. And in this project right now, it's a Global Affairs Canada project in Gambella, the Gambella region of Ethiopia, um, where there are some 380,000 refugees from South Sudan. And we have a project working with uh, 50,000, 52,000 older people, people with special needs and disabilities in that region. It's been an amazing uh, week or so. So I'm thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to be here with you all. I, I first I just thought I would uh, respond to your second question first about how we approach ageism and then I'll mention a couple of projects that of how we're attempting to address uh, ageism uh, in Canada particularly and particularly around technology. So along with Help Age International of which we are a network partner our real approach to ageism is one of sy systemic ageism uh, and and so we try to approach ageism uh, in three ways, from a, the visible aspects of society, the things that we can see and observe clearly, like language and actions and events, formal rules that exist in society, 
as well as people's thoughts and feelings. So social norms and customs, what are the unwritten rules that are shaping what is generally accepted as normal behavior? And then thirdly, what are the beliefs and values that we hold as individuals, as well as as a, as a dominant society that inform those thoughts and feelings that are at the root of our actions as a society? So when we approach and addressing the issue of ageism, I think it's really critical that we really dig deep and we're not just always attacking the, the top, but we have a great image that we use at HealthAge that's like a, a flower, a stem and the roots. So how can we really get to the root of the issue? There's lots of approaches. So we, we take the approach of you know, supporting the convention on the rights of older people um, and, and affecting the way that government from a top down approach will, will address those things as well as how do we work with older people? How do we work with uh, younger generations and people of, of, of all ages within society to approach and speak in the, our language, the way we speak about older persons uh, and so on? How do we address uh, stereotypes? You know, often we, we embody our own stereotypes that maybe come from a good place, a place of protective feelings. Um, but many, in many cases, those can become paternalistic and can rob uh, people of their freedom and their capacity to participate in the decisions that affect them. So for help, in Help Age Canada, in the, in the technology space, we're in right, we just launched a program, Connected Elders and Youth in Nunavut in the Kilovic region. We're working with uh, uh, 12 communities, bringing uh, tablets and uh, uh, in Inuk sensitive, culturally sensitive education programs for older people through Youth Mentors, uh, which is a really exciting program. And we're also launching a program called Dig It, which is a Nash pan-Canadian program providing tablets and digital literacy to low-income uh, older Canadians to uh, facilitate their learning, to challenge their own uh, beliefs about ageism, uh, and to encourage and engage them in participating in the digital world. So that's a little bit about what we do and how we approach ageism uh, as an organization. That's wonderful. I'm going to keep it at that high systems level and move it to Jane Barrett to answer for her question. Then we're going to kind of narrow down into Canada and business and then again down to all of. So Jane, over to you. Look, thanks, Laura. And it's great to be with you all today. Um, Jane Barrett, Secretary General of the International Federation on Aging. We're a non-state actor at the World Health Organization and have general consultative status at the United Nations. And I, I say that because, you know, the IFA and all of its portfolios for the next decade is being viewed through the four lenses of the United Nations decade of healthy aging. One being age-friendly environments. Two, primary integrated care three, ageism, and four, long-term care. Now, ageism really is a cross-cutting issue. It is the most profound and insidious ism of my lifetime, along with racism and sexism. You know, so, and I say my time because I'm it. You know, ageism is about the way we think, feel, and act about age and aging. It's the way that I think, feel, and act. Because there are three broad ways of looking at ageism, self-identifying. And my guess is that you do it as well as I do it. You know, as I grow older, there are things that I'm finding challenging. Is it ageism? That I don't try harder? You know, it's self-identifying interpersonal ageism and systemic ageism. You know, IFA believes that this is the most profound barrier of our time to healthy aging. We're going to talk about combating ageism, but I'll just give you just a little sort of glimmer of what we do at IFA of the world's aging population. How do we do this? We bring together unlike I've long past talked only to those in the field of ageing. We must bring together different disciplines and different sectors to develop a common agenda towards healthy ageing. So, for example, did you know that in Canada, not all older people have the ability to access screening for their vision? 
Did you know that different provinces have different vaccine schedules? Free vaccines are available in some provinces and not in others. Now that's a fundamental applied issue around ageism. So it's not only about employment practices, we can look at every aspect of societal living. And remember, ageism is not only about older people. You know, it is across the life course. And that's why from the 1st of October, which was the International Day of Older Persons, to the 20th of November, World Children's Day, the WHO and IFA and all of you here should be striving to combat ageism through an expansive global agenda, social media agenda. So I'll stop there, uh, Laura, um, and be involved in discussions further on, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Jane. And I'm capturing some of the key thoughts in the chat. Do feel free to add your thoughts at any point. Again, if you've got a question, I'll make sure to make note of that as well. I'm really inspired by the idea of moving from the International Day of the Older Person to the International Day of the Child and thinking about it in a life course approach because ageism does affect everyone. Moving to you, Anne-Marie, you've been thinking about, you know, obviously leadership within the Canadian context, thought leadership, media is a big piece of what you're working in, and also with the business. So share a little bit about your work and how you were thinking about ageism in that work. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura, and I'm very privileged to be with all of the folks on this call today. I, uh, my goal really is to add some new perspective, a different kind of perspective, and my comments today are going to be very much from an industry economic perspective, because between Olive and Gregor and Jane, all of that perspective is so well represented. Having said that, you are unlimited as a purpose-based business. What we do is we shine a light on uh, issues related to powerful aging. We, sh we look for solutions and create promotion around those solutions that drive powerful aging. We want to create momentum around uh, smashing myths around uh, ageism in general. So what we see from a, let's call it from a business or industry perspective, that there's this vast, vast, vast chasm between what industry and what people believe an aging adult is versus what research actually says that they do and want. And so this vast chasm, these negative dated perceptions of ageism are, are, are actually limiting both societal and economic growth in a very negative way. I have worked in business for a long time. I've been a marketer for a long time. You'll see that most businesses these days are spending millions of dollars trying to understand millennials, what they need and want. And that's not a bad thing, but what they're not doing is spending the same kind of energy and effort against what is projected to be a $33 trillion industry by 2026. So that understanding of this aging consumer being able to create products, services, and solutions that they actually want and need versus creating a solution that is based on a negative perception or a false perception of what they want and need is a very, very missed opportunity in industry today. We like to say that energy goes where money flows. So what we like to try and do is to get whether it's the financial service industry, the healthcare industry in particular, interested in aging adults in a very positive, momentum-focused way. Why is this important? It's because ageism limits economic expansion. Ageism limits innovation in productive and powerful ways. So if we can eliminate ageist views, we open the door for innovation and positive growth.
this is an incredibly important conversation. And I see that one of our members that's joining us today is even from Silicon Valley. And if we're thinking about ageism, you know, that connection with technology is really interesting. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But you know, there have been really interesting studies talking about when ageism starts. And of course, it's totally socially constructed. That's a surprise to nobody. Ageism in Silicon Valley apparently starts at about 30. And I just changed uh, my tipping point over to 50 this year. And for the first time, I'm starting to think about things in a different way. You know, when we're thinking about ageism, it is the idea of self, it is that idea of peers and others. And it is also those systemic pieces. You know, Henry, when you're talking about you know, energy and money and connection, it is really interesting, because there's been lots of thought pieces done on why you're mixing the boat by you know, marketing to the 18 to 35 year olds just on a demographic basis alone, let alone the fact that if you're trying to sell something, the people with money are the older people. Now, not all people who are older have money. I understand that. But if we're looking at a, a large group of assets, that is an important piece. And really, the only answer there is ageism. And uh, it's, you know, not good business as well as it's not good social impact. So let's talk a little bit about that connection of myths and technology. So my next round question is this. Let's talk a little bit about how common myths of older adults, uh, technological realities, which are sometimes quite different than what people think, uh, how they can be used and uh, blown up. I like that idea that you're talking about blowing up myths. How we can blow up myths about older people and particularly their interaction with technology. Gregor, I am going to come back to you because I know you kicked it off, but you were talking a little bit about some of the work that you were doing up in Nunavut on technology, but I know that you have taken a really close look at how technology and tech equity amongst older people is a driving need, and you've done a lot of this during the pandemic as well. So can you speak to me a little bit about those things to kick us off? Uh, sure. Um, you know, we, we again, uh, um, we Help Age Canada in Canada are, you know, we work towards isolation and loneliness, particularly with low income seniors. So we're always looking for the opportunity to support where there are gaps. And the, identi the identification of digital literacy and access to technology really came out of the COVID-19 pandemic where, where we responded to, to a need with humanitarian relief at the beginning of the pandemic as the Canadian government stepped into place and began uh, filling that, that role. We really identified that many older people who were isolated and lonely did not have access to technology. They, they couldn't speak on Zoom. People in hospice, uh, ordering groceries, healthcare in the North, in the Arctic, um, so we, we started working with different partners to try and find solutions for that specific group of people. Now, I know there are many, many older people in Canada are very used to using technology, have it very accessible, but there are, are many also who, who don't. Um, so that was a real opportunity for us. And what really came out was access to equipment, particularly data, being able to use to have access to affordable data, but also age-friendly uh, learning. And I have to say one of the great components of that is a, the ageism inherent, not just all in the fullness of society, but in older people themselves, in the assumption, well, I'm too old for technology, or I can't learn how to do this. This is for younger folks. We had to deal with that all the time and, and really work at creating solutions and uh, uh, education processes that uh, were really able to uh, capture and speak to that uh, uh, demographic, that older uh, older people, and we've had some great uh, uh, success and learning there as we as we go. So I held all of back for one second on purpose because I wanted you to respond to both of those things together, all of. I hope that you'll give me that moderator's privilege. I know that you have been very much a vocal proponent of thinking about how to debunk myths and about making sure that 
older adults aren't living or internalizing those myths as well. You've been passionate about this through your scholarship. You've been passionate about this through your advocacy. So given the framing, you know, you're the expert in my case on the lived experience, giving the framing of the introductions of the organizations, giving the framing of some of what we heard about how they're thinking about ageism, can I get you to respond to all of those things together? No pressure, all of it, but I know that you can live up to it. So talk a little bit about yourself, your personal personal journey, your ageism, and then maybe also respond a little bit to your thoughts about the individual older person in technology. Yeah, I'm a little intimidated just listening and to all that's happening out there in the world of aging, what, what the other panelists are talking about, what we're bringing to bear on the subject at a sort of global level, at the level of technology and so on. Um, I'm, I'm totally in awe of that and in awe of all the things that are happening. I myself um, have to confess that I'm nearly 80 years old, but I have never, I don't, age doesn't function in my thoughts on a daily basis or anything. I come from Jamaica where we would say, you lose your age paper your birth certificate, because it, it doesn't play into my life. I just get on with it every day, do what I have to do. But I think that part of that is my mindset. But I think part of it arises out of the fact that I've spent my life as a creative, as a creative person, as a writer. And I think that is one of the factors that keeps you engaged. I'm engaged with the world constantly, even today. I'm constantly working. I'm I'm, I want to know what is happening in the world. And that in a way prevents me from focusing too much on myself and on my own, um, you know, whatever my own problems might be. And this is also the way I have managed to get through the pandemic by writing through it, by writing pandemic poems. Um, I have students, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very active. So that's my story, which means I'm a bit of an, anomaly, I guess. And I'm very fortunate because I'm, I'm healthy. And I think for older people, that is the most significant factor in how you relate to yourself and you relate to the world. Because I think ageism is not just a social um, factor, but aging, ageism, meaning how we're perceived, also affects us as individuals and how we, in turn, we internalize how um, the, the world views us, and then we reflect that. And what I would say is that, um, you know, the mantra, act your age, is meant to put us in our places. But I would say to older people, act your age, you know, just as a way of breaking out of the stereotypes, as a way of saying to people, we are individuals. We're not a, a block of people who after age 60 or however age is defined in or various countries, park us somewhere, you know. Um, I'm saying that change can only come about through collective action, through the work of, say, my fellow panelists here and others in a, accomplishing change at, a, at a, um, the, the bigger level. But I also feel that change has to start with every single individual each of us as an older person has to reject the stereotype and we have to say to ourselves, I, this is when I'm going to live my best life. And that best life, of course, is dictated by who you are, your circumstances, your health and so on. I'm not suggesting that all of us should go out there and kick up our feet and dance, though that, that's not a bad idea. But I'm just saying that um, we will only accomplish global change um, if each individual accepts a responsibility for being the best you can be and reject, all, and each individual should simply reject what society has impo is imposing on us, which is that, you know, your life is over, be quiet, sit down, whatever. Um, as an individual, I reject that, but I think all of us as individuals have a duty to reject that stereotyping and, and to not internalize it 
and say to ourselves, you know, these are the best years of our lives because we have already done all the things we're supposed to have done. And these years belong to us. We should use them in the best way we can because that is the only way we are gonna convince the rest of society that we are individuals. Absolutely. That can make a contribution to the world. We can change the world. Yeah, you can see why I waited for Olive to go, because like you can't go Olive first and then people can follow. It's just not fair. So thank you so much. We want to hear from you now. So we've got a poll ready. So let's get ready to launch our poll. Darina. So the, I'm going to read out it out for people, but uh, you should have it on your screen now. It says, how important is combating ageism to you? You get to choose only one. Extremely important, very important, moderately important, slightly important, or not important at all. Now, if you are not important at all, you are probably on the wrong session, but we welcome you anyway, because we want diverse roles. All right, give you a couple more seconds. How important is combating ageism to you? Five more seconds. All right, Darina, what do we got? What is our answer? Okay, so we have a extremely important and very important overall. And then we got some folks here, a 14 out of our 109, moderately important, and one person from our slightly important. And apparently no one is in the wrong session. So that's great to hear about. Thank you. We were talking a little bit about technology and all of you've been engaged in all kinds of technology. You're very engaged in well as well. And Marie, can I come to you and, and give me a sense? We all know that, yes, older people do use technology. We do know that there are some barriers. You know, that's all old hat. We know that. But technology and designing for technology is also imbued with ageism as well. Can you share a little bit about your experiences with that? Yeah, completely. Thank you so much, Olive. It is incredibly difficult to follow your passion, but I, uh, it's fantastic. I, a couple of comments on it. Uh, I get to ask this question about aging adults and technology all the time, and I, and I, and I use a somewhat tongue-in-cheek expression around this is, who do we think invented the internet? Who do we think invented technology? aging adults. Um, this is a, uh, a, 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 a generation of people who have blown up the world in so many different ways, whether it's feminism or many of the other causes in the world. Why do we believe that at a magic age called 65 or whatever it is, they stop doing that? So um, what you see in the, in the world uh, of business is that, and all of um, touched on this a bit, is is typically speaking, anybody over 50 is put into a homogeneous blob of everybody. Uh, whereas real business takes a look at defined segmentation, um, which is oftentimes done by age court, age cohort. So a 25 to 35 year old, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't happen in the world of marketing today. People over 50, they're all the same. So we always like to say that 50 are not, is not 65, 65 is not 80. More important to this, however, is the conversation that demographic segmentation is a dead science. Um, all of, I think, was the best example of how business needs to understand state of mind, needs based on circumstance, as opposed to needs based on age. And so if business itself can make a lot of change in diminishing ageism by simply removing these demographic segmentation tools that they use to determine the development of products, services, solutions. They also need to talk to people. I am stunned daily by the number of businesses who do not quite understand in fact, do not understand this aging consumer whatsoever, nor do they know how to talk to them in ways that are meaningful. They're preparing these product services solutions based on these data ages perspectives. Joseph Coughlin, who spoke on the first day of the conference, said something like, why do we keep creating products that are dull and beige for this audience? Let's break that. Let's understand what people want and need based on their state of mind. Okay, that's another one I'm taking away from this dull and beige. Absolutely. Or, you know, ones that we, we think, you know, have you ever met an older person? I mean, you're looking at some of the protective devices that people have, you think, 
Who wants to carry that or wear yeah, that? Nobody yeah, wants maybe. a big device on themselves. No, who? Yeah, it's, yeah I, I wrote an article called Stop Lowjacking Grandma, right? Like, just because there is technology it doesn't have to happen to you. You know, we've got some great questions. I promise to weave those in. And I, I can see those in the chat right now. Jane, I want to just kick this off as well. And, and I'm going to flag the second question to my other uh, experts here as well. So the question that was originally posed is as a younger person hmm. who's developing technology for seniors. So this is a person who gets it, right? They're already wanting to do it, but you know, they don't have necessarily that kind of experience. So this person is saying that they're often faced with doubts about mobility, ability, motivation for adoption of new devices. What's the best way to counter this and convince others that seniors are more than capable and willing to learn new things? And I'm going to link as well, because the next question is saying, what can we learn from and apply from other movements? And I actually think that those conversation points could even go together. So I'm going to start with Jane, then open up those questions to my colleagues as well. Sure. Look, thanks. And, and what a great question. So thank you. I want to start off by saying that, you know, we make a fundamental error in saying older people. Right? That's the first thing. And it's not older people, it's me, it's Olive, it's Laura. It's So we can't group. And please, no one ever say baby boomers because we're, we're not. You know, that's three generations in this cohort. So let's get rid of the labels to start off with. You know, and I think also we've got to remember that just under 50% of the world are not even connected. So let's actually really understand that even in high income countries, the connectivity, you know, for some people of all ages is not there. Right? So that's the first thing. You know, in response to this question, and it's a great question from a younger person, whatever young means, hey? Right? And because we know from the evidence-based report from the WHO, and I've popped it in the uh, chat box, we know what works to combat ageism. And one of the things is intergenerational connectedness. So for that person that asked the question, you're on the right, right road. What we also need to remember is as we grow older, you know, our thinking is not as quick. It's there. It's very much there, but it may not. It, it takes us a bit of a couple of seconds to process. Our vision may not be like it was in 20. Our hearing may not have been what it was like when we were younger, but we are functioning independently in the world. And so, you know, as the, yes, this person who asked the question has a conversation, you know, with their peers, have the same conversation with that person who you're trying to invent, trying to create this new device, because what they want to do is be able to communicate, to connect, to engage, that's their goal. So what are you going to do in conversation with this person and further people? How are you going to design something that will meet their needs? Not what you think that they need, but what their needs. Key, key word here, function. It actually has to maintain and improve function. And the catch all phrase around the decade of healthy aging is we want to create an environment that enables older people to do what they have reason to value. We want to create an environment that enables an older person to do what they have reason to value. So the question is a terrific question. Yes, you're on the right track. Yes, it actually combats ageism. Yes, technology is a conduit to engagement. And so people are connected in the world. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Olive. I'm going to come to you on that. You've been a champion of rights for years and all kinds of different rights. That's been a piece of your thinking and your creativity. You know, I wonder if you could respond to that, but also, you know, share a little bit of your thoughts and knowledge around how the practical wins or some of the things that we were thinking through around some of the other movements could also inform this movement too. Well, um, I know we're talking here about technology as if it's the, the engine of whatever is gonna happen in the world. And it is to a certain extent. But I also would like us to think of other ways in which we can create spaces for older people that doesn't involve technology, that engages people across age groups. Because I think one of the things that's missing in the lives of many older 
people is the opportunity to interact with younger people. And it's also important for young people to have the opportunity to interact. So I think alongside our thinking about engaging with say technology, we should also be thinking of other ways in which we might provide spaces for older people. Personally, I'm at a stage now in my life, I'd love to chuck technology and go and just have a garden. You know, I mean, in other words, I really think we need to develop a mindset where we see not just one um, w one way out of this dilemma or one, one space, which is a technologically driven space, which I agree is important. But I also think we need to be thinking of other ways in which we can enable older people to live fulfilled lives and to share with others and to be creative in different ways. I mean, one doesn't have to be a writer or a painter or an artist. You can be a gardener or you, you know, you, you can go sit, sit on a park bench, teach some kids to knit or crochet. In other words, I, I would like us to, to look also at ways that are not technologically driven, because as I say, I find a lot of older people I know are tired of having to learn. <laughs> um, the problem with technology personally, I find is that it keeps changing. I like the idea of learning something and sticking with it. And I think um, a lot of people are like me, but you know, um, technology is based on innovation and bringing in new things every day. And I think more than anything else, that is a trial for older people. And so I think even the way we think about technology as a whole and how we're providing it um, is, is, you know, maybe not, might not be the right way because it's young, as you say, it's younger people thinking about what to do for older people. So that's a really practical step as well that you're talking about is when we're thinking about technology and improvements and expansions to not make it in a way that's exhausting to people yeah. and to not make it so that the user experience, even if it's a knitting needle, by the way, could you teach me to knit? I've tried so many times and I cannot knit to save my soul, but to be able to have a way of learning, of engaging, of being lifted up by the change rather than exhausted and afraid of it where you fall off. So thank you all. That was really an important piece for us to keep in our minds because new, you know, new is fine, but unless you understand it and are able to be excited and incorporate it, it's really can be another one of those things that can create a divide. Gregor, I'm going to come to you next, if it's okay. You know, you and your, in your work are often thinking about practical ways of fixing things. Like what I love about HelpAge, both Canada and international is, yes, you link about the big ideas, but you're also right on the ground. And I know that you've been thinking about how to combat ageism in some practical ways. So for you, you must hold a vision of what a world without ageism looks like and you must be also thinking about some practical steps that you guys are taking to combat it can you share a little bit of how you're thinking or acting on those things yeah sure i i mean i i, I first i'd like just like to say that you know technology is is first and foremost it's an enabler you know it's it's as olive was saying it's when we talk about uh, ageism and technology, it's a, it's a vehicle, it's an enabler to address ageism. And, you know, when we, we talk about how we're practically engaging and, and trying to address ageism as an organization, again, like everyone else, this is new territory. I mean, we're in, in a way, we're, we're trying to figure it out as we go. Uh, we're, we're doing the best we can. We're, we're trying things. We, we make mistakes. We, we, we're engaging. It's a step-by-step -step kind, of, kind of process. And for us, again, always in the back of our minds is, and, and for me personally, is really getting, in, in terms of a systemic approach to ageism, is really addressing the roots, the values and beliefs that we hold. Because we do need to ad address the, the top, the, the, the actual uh, expression in the world, but how do we get down to the root cause of our own inherent, as Jane was saying, our own inherent and individual uh, stereotypes and held beliefs. And one of those areas that I really think is, 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 intergenerate, is intergenerationalism, if you could say such a thing. So how can we use technology to really uh, address and bring together older and younger people? Because as a society, 
we no longer have those platforms available to us the way they were for generations. You know, as we move into a Western, more secular, uh, Western approach, you know, for example, church, our, our faith traditions are, are less common. They're not the central part of our lives anymore. And they were the last, in a sense, institutions where every generation was present and we took it for granted. And those, those are no longer there. So how can, how can uh, technology be a platform that is inherently multi-generational? That's an area that we're always really trying to think about. We have our, some colleagues in Moldova, Help Age International in Moldova. They have some amazing technology programs working with, with youth and older people, as well as our approach in, in Nunavut, where there's opportunities for elders to teach and share wisdom, crafts, uh, you know, discussing about the, the, the thickness of the ice at the, at the flow edge where they go to hunt and, and sharing the traditions with the youth as they're learning the technology and using the technology to enhance that. So we're always seeking out this two-way conversation between uh, uh, youth and or every age group to be able to, uh, to go to the heart, to our values and beliefs that ho hopefully will move up the chain to our actions and the way that we, 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 we act and work in the world. I don't know if I got to your question, but I was inspired again by Olive's thoughts there and it kind of took me there. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask two things for us to happen at the same time. I am going to in the chat say, if I had a million dollars, right? So if you all had a million dollars, what would you do? What program would you do? How would you spend that money? Tell us what you would do if you had a million dollars. Be creative. Do that in the chat. While we're doing that, Jorina, let's launch our second and last poll. So in the chat, I'm asking you to do two things at once. If you had a million dollars, what would you do? And then poll number two is, do you think ageism will change as a result of COVID-19? Explain your answer in the chat if you like. So I guess you could say it's changes in worse or changes in better or not sure at all. So uh, we're having this two part. So one, do you think ageism will change as a result of COVID-19? Explain your answer. I'm going to ask our, our experts this as well. And uh, okay, two more minutes. Now let's make it two more seconds. All right, let's close off the poll. There you go. What do we have here? Do we think it's going to change? Okay, all over the map. Not sure. Yes, no. I'm going to ask each one of you experts in turn to answer that question very quickly. So Anne-Marie, do you think it's going to change? 30 seconds. Yes, no, or why? Oh, you're super smart, but I got to hear you, dear. Okay. There's that mute button. Sorry. Yeah, COVID has absolutely shown the uh, disparities uh, in, in, uh, in related to age. I'm an eternal optimist. Yes, this is a time to seize now. Now is the time to deal with the issue of ageism um, to, uh, based on a lot of the things that happened during COVID. Jane, what do you think? Uh, no. Uh, COVID has brutally exposed what we already knew. Remember, the bodies in the fridges. Remember, the, the, the people that died in long-term care. What it, what it has done is woken us up. We need to pivot and we need to unite, but it hasn't changed what is. Yeah. Gregor. Well, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Anne Marie here. I I'm I'm the I'm an optimist, and I I think that this awakening that COVID has uh, has brought to us is going to move us to action. I mean, we have movement now, more movement with the Convention on the Rights of Older People, the UN Convention on the Rights of Older People. We have opportunity for discussion. There's a lot more movement in government. We have. Uh, I just think it's a tremendous opportunity, but it's not just going to happen. It's up to us to do it. It's up to us to do it. Laura, I've just got to say, look, I am the eternal optimist. You know, I am. But we also have to be real with the fact that we were dealing with this all the way before COVID. Now, this is a, this is a window and we have some strategies, but if we do not unite, as we were not united before, then nothing is going to change. So civil society, which includes industry, needs to unite in a common purpose. And WHO has given us the tools. So, sorry, Laura. <laughs> 
No, I, that's exactly I, right. All of it want to come to you. So what do you think about ageism and COVID-19? Better, worse, not sure? And what is your thought? Well, I, I would agree with, with, um, with everything that's been said in that I think COVID is changing everything, whether we, you know, whether we like it or not, changing it in all kinds. So I think we need to accept, yes, it is changing it. But I agree with Jane that um, like many other things, um, where is this change taking us? Are we, you know, how, how much is gonna be changed? How much is gonna be transformed? Because we do need an absolute transformation of how older people are treated, especially in institutions as we saw. Are we gonna get that those changes? I, I would say yes, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm with um, Anne-Marie and Gregor here. I'm the eternal optimist. And I do think that certainly um, industrial societies anyway have been shocked by what has been happening to older people. Of course, there are many parts of the world where, um, you know, th this is not even an issue because there are so many problems that are being faced by, by the poorer nations that the, the issue of ageism is just a blip on the horizon in terms of everything that they have to deal with. So I think we need to be very careful about distinguishing between the wealthier nations and what is possible and what is happening in the rest of the world, even in relation to vaccines and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there isn't a global model of, of this, but um, I, I would say though that the one, if one thing comes out of COVID is exposing the weaknesses in society. And I hope that that will enable us to deal with them. I'm inspired by your conversations. I'm inspired by the chat. Again, I'm going to ask you, if I had a million dollars, what would you do? We've got people listening, people writing grants, people thinking about what they could do. So let's have your good ideas. I appreciate it. And if I had a million dollars, you know, one of the things I would do is actually start a really robust anti-ageism campaign. And I would do this with a thoughtful, provoking, creative arts <laughs> approach. I would be black in the same ways that we've done anti-smoking campaigns or anti-racism campaigns. And then I would make sure that we are linking that to practical steps to help people understand ageism in their own workplaces, in their own lives. So that practical piece I think is really important. So those are the pieces that I wanted to share. I'm going to move to our last couple minutes wrap up and I'm going to ask, you know, I'm always asking everyone practical things. So I'm gonna ask each of you the same question. What are steps that individuals in their own lives can take that you recommend to either combat ageism, address ageism, or route out ageism? So whichever way, and you know, I think, I know I'm gonna leave all of your last words. I'm gonna to come to you last, all of I'm gonna like you to wrap up here. Anne-Marie, can I start with you? Is that okay? What is a practical step that individuals can do to combat, identify, or route out ageism in their lives? Right, they're connected. Uh, words matter, the power of words. We need a new lexicon for aging. Um, <clears throat> in one of our sessions yesterday that You Are Unlimited ran, um, the word aging is being eliminated globally from a lot of language and turning into longevity, um, the, Laura, you, you, you use the word lifespan, life course, et cetera. It removes a lot of what I call the perceptions around aging. In concert with that, see aging as an economic force. Let's take this, this cost drain mentality away from aging that we all have and put an economic force for change in front of that. Brilliant. Jane, what would you do? Say it's okay to grow older. I, you know, it's it's okay to grow older. It's okay to someone, you know, it's okay. You know, I think our society, some of our societies, and all of you made a great point, you know, in some, in some, some, some societies, they celebrate when you're 65, 70, 75 and 80. You know, it's a big thing. Say it's okay to growing old. That's the first thing. That's self-identifying. But also join the decade platform. There are there is a platform. Join a global community. You know, we don't have to recreate things. It's there. The decade digital platform is calling on us to join a global community. 
so that we can drive the campaign to combat ageism. So be self-identifying and take action as an individual, as an organisation and as a wider community. And don't forget older women, older men, older prisoners, older refugees, you know, older LGB2, 2RQS, LGBT. We're with you. We know the yeah. acronym's ever evolving. <laughs> so, you know, just, just remember that we're unique individuals and say yes to aging. Say yes to aging. I love that. Gregor, over to you. What's the thing that you would do? I think I would really invite people to start from, from within to really, you know, look at tools or ways to approach and, and look inside at our own stereotypes, our own assumptions about aging, but even our own assumptions about the value of life. Is there a, a time of life that for you is somehow more important or more sacred than another time in life? You know, what, do we, what assumptions do we hold deep within ourselves first as we look out into the world? And I would also invite everyone, and I'll pop, pop it in the uh, chat again here, to go to the Help Age uh, International website. We have a whole section on, on ageism, how to create a campaign in your community, a workbook on, on approaching systemic ageism. How, do we, how can we approach and look within and also look within our own communities, how to create some great creative programs. Laura, there's your million dollars right there. I invite you to go and, and check that out. So I would say start within and then go outward into the world because this change is, is long and we have to start at the one place where we can change, which is our own selves uh, within. Olive, I'm giving you the last word. What would you do on a <laughs> practical basis to combat aging or inspire people to do it? Yeah, well, let me just say to I absolutely, I thought Gregor had the last word just yes. then um, about where it starts with us as individuals. But you know, one of the things that I, I would love if I had a million dollars um, to do is to bring together old people and very young people to find a way of doing that. I know there are societies who do this, but I think that if we're gonna change the narrative about aging, it has to begin with the smallest children. And I say this because yesterday on social media somewhere, I saw where somebody had asked small kids to draw pictures of what 40 year old people looked like, and they were all bent over with canes. And the whole response was, oh, you know, they can hardly walk and so on. So I'm saying that the perception about aging begins there with the smallest children. So we need to find ways of changing the narrative, not just within ourselves and how we, we behave and perform, but also with how we show the, um, aging or older people to the younger and maybe start changing the narrative, the thinking about aging, about age groups and so on, about the beginning and end of life with let's start, let's put those, the beginning and end together in some ways to change the narrative. Wonderful. This has been such a concrete and environment and just an engaging session. I'm inspired by all of you. I'm going to ask you to keep sending us if you had a million dollar ideas on social media. I'm going to turn it back to you, Doreen, to share a little bit of information about the next session. But I am so grateful to our experts today and so grateful all of you joined this conversation. And I hope you found the chat discourse engaging and interesting and full of resources as well.